On the Ground, presented by The Cube. Here's your host, Jeff Frick. Hi, Jeff Frick here with The Cube. We are on the ground at the Mission Bay Conference Center at, at the Bit, or not the Bitcoin, I'm still saying Bitcoin, it's the blockchain conference. Really, blockchain is, is kind of separating itself from Bitcoin, which is the application a lot of us know about, but blockchain is a much broader application, and we're seeing a lot more talk about it outside the context of Bitcoin. So we wanted to come up here, get, uh, get a taste of what's going on. We're really excited to be joined by Dustin Byington, the co-founder and president of Tendermint. Yes. Welcome, Dustin. Thank you, thank you for having me. So for the people that aren't familiar with Tendermint, give us a little, uh, little overview. Well, uh, first and foremost, Tendermint makes blockchains simple. Um, there's a lot of complexity in this world of um, distributed ledger and consensus, and um, it's very challenging uh, both conceptually and um, for application developers to grab their, wrap their minds around this. Um, and so the key aim of Tendermint is to simplify uh, blockchains and bring them to enterprise. Now it's interesting because the complexity was kind of built in as part of what you wanted when the main application was Bitcoin, right? You wanted right. to make it harder for people to cheat and steal and break the system, oh, but sure. this is a totally different type of an application. Sure, well like uh, some of our friends are at the Blockstream and um, you know, uh, they talk about you know, purposely, you know, blockchain is, is supposed to be difficult to change. Uh, that, I, I personally think that has a very useful, a great use case in like digital gold, but uh, when you have a system that's very monolithic, uh, has a lot of inertia to it, um, doesn't meet the needs of enterprise, uh, particularly given that uh, you hear a lot of talk about permissionless permission, um, and I think it's important to get a little more granular there with what that means. Um, what we're really talking about is the validation of transactions. And so in Bitcoin, anybody can validate transactions. All you have to do is uh, burn some electricity, um, and that's so it's permissionless validation. And um, that actually is uh, a bug, not a feature for uh, enterprise clients particularly those in the financial services industry who want to ensure, who, who love knowing who their counterparties are um, and are particularly concerned about uh, their counterparties um, working in like you know, North Korea. So in Bitcoin, conceivably, someone could validate a transaction in North Korea and if you're a financial services uh, company, did you just uh, do business with North Korea? Um, that could potentially be an OFAC violation and now you're dealing with the Department of Defense. So right, right. Uh, from kind of get the, the start, Bitcoin is not necessarily a, a great solution and you see a lot of rebranding away from Bitcoin to blockchain. And um, so Tendermint exists to, to, you know, it's built, been built from the ground up with the needs of enterprise clients in mind. So then how do you kind of merge the needs for enterprise customers and the SEC and, and you know, there's a lot of kind of public the information that has to be there be validated mm -hmm. with kind of what was sold as the benefit of Bitcoin, which was you didn't have this trusted intermediary, uh -huh. just just kind of happened and uh -huh. suddenly you've got the credits in your in your account. Uh -huh. How do enterprises use the benefits of blockchain but still take care of the much more difficult compliance regulatory uh, restrictions that they have? Sure, sure. so um, at the heart of any blockchain stack is this thing called the Byzantine fault tolerant algorithm. And Byzantine just means it's like, Byzantine is like a malicious actor, somebody who is like looking to you know, potentially attack the system. And so uh, Bitcoin can operate completely in the wild because it's Byzantine fault tolerant. There can be these Byzantine actors, and there are all the time, trying to change the database to give themselves more money. But um, Bitcoin is very robust and tolerant to those kinds of attacks. Um, you can, however, it's a bit of a misnomer that uh, BFT, Bitcoin was the, um, uh, the creator of BFT. In fact, there was some academic research going back to the late 80s and 90s about how to construct these systems um, using uh, quorums and digital signatures instead of energy and hashes. And so that's the security model that we employ that helps you have all the same traits of Bitcoin in that you can remove these central interme intermediaries and the systems themselves can provide the trust and the security and so you can exchange directly in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion at scale. Right. Um, and so that's really, you know, consortiums are our first uh, major play there. Uh, you know, you think about 20, 40 banks getting together, wanting to now engage directly in a FX swap instead of having to go through like a clearinghouse or a depository that has their own set of costs um, and increases the time to settlement, increase time, increase risk. And so uh, the value prop to uh, financial institutions is clear, and we're working with a number of them. Uh, 
both to be building on our platform and as our first customers, our first customers in the, the foreign exchange space. Um, but also, I think there is um, a use case in the um, in the Fortune 500 company, the non-financial services world as well. Yeah, the Mark Andreessen's piece on the on the Byzantine generals problem, you know, for me was kind of the wake up call to look beyond mm -hmm. Bitcoin as mm -hmm. really an exchange of value in a non-intermediary, to really look at the bigger problem, the math problem, the computer science problem, mm -hmm. to have these, these kind of transactions. So, we know about financial services and financial transactions. What are you seeing in the marketplace for the application of blockchain in things like medical and things you know, beyond financial services? Sure, I think um, if you, we spent a lot of time thinking about these different use cases as being in the permission blockchain space, we wanted to make sure that we were solving real problems and not just reinventing a, you know, a better database that could, or a database that could be outperformed by existing legacy databases. And what we came to realize was that um, Fortune 500 like companies, multinationals, really very much resemble uh, conglomerates. Uh, I'm sorry, pardon me, consortiums, consortia. Um, in that, if you think about um, a multinational that has, um, they have departments all over the world, regions all over the world, they don't necessarily trust one another. And so where does that trust come from? Uh, usually that trust comes from the corporate office. And that can both in a similar way that um, that creates cost, that reduces the, the speed and the efficiency of the system when it's always funneling up in this kind of hierarchical manner. Um, and so we do think that there's a, a big play um, in the non-financial um, services space, but also you know, you're, you're, there's the use cases sort of abound, whether it's there's some interesting ones about diamonds and supply chain. So, um, you know, it's still yet to kind of be determined um, exactly how creative people are going to be, but I would look for, uh, think about blockchains as trust as a service. So now, um, instead of using, you know, who are the general providers of trust? You've got, you know, depositories, clearinghouses, um, governments, think about voting, right? When you're voting, um, you're tr you have this government that you're trusting is going to count all the votes and like, you know, elect the proper person. Now, instead of trusting a government, you could trust technology, you can trust a network. Um, and so I think it'd be really interesting to see how the use cases shape out. Yeah, that's pretty interesting, trust as a service, because you know, there were some talks in the earlier keynotes about the, you know, removing friction, just removing a, a third party, removing barriers to transactions, because they're not big enough for a third party to get involved, a lot of things. But the trust is an interesting one, because there's still opportunities when you have the trust, but you still want some of these other benefits of less friction, not a third party, or? It depends, it's possible. Um, I, I'd really encourage thinking about it, it, thinking about um, use cases that they do have some trust element, element to it. Um, and also, you like trust is so deep in the stack, too, that when you, when you totally change the trust model, then the whole stack that's built on top of it, you're like, wow, why, why would I architect it this way? Like all of these things are built, on, like especially in the financial services world, under this like basic premise that you know banks don't totally trust each other. And so when you can change that and you can sort of allow them to pay for this trust in like a very you know cost efficient, effective manner, then you know you can change lots of things and you start changing some things and that ripples up and allows you to reconstruct things in different areas. So. It'll be really interesting to see what the ripple effects are of uh, changing the trust model. So I'll give you the last word before we drop off. Um, a lot of enthusiasm here at the show, yeah. but from kind of outsiders, kind of new to the space, what should they look for in 2016 as kind of indications of, of traction and indications uh, of blockchain really starting to gain hold, again, outside of the context specifically of Bitcoin? You know, it's going to be um, adoption. Adoption by the corporates, uh, the enterprise, um, the, the, the old platforms really didn't meet their needs. And, um, and also, um, the, the consumer play hasn't quite taken off like people expected either. And so now, uh, you see massive shift towards the enterprise and B2B plays, but they didn't have the underlying, um, the underlying platforms, the underlying structures to really solve their needs. And so now that we have these tools in place, we're going to really rapidly see some production quality applications that are going to really shake things up. All right, Dustin. Well, thanks for right. taking a few minutes Thank out you. of your busy day. Right, appreciate Dustin it. Dustin Byton from Tenderman. I'm Jeff Rick. You're watching theCUBE. See you next time. Thanks, Jeff.